Hello, uh, warm welcome to everybody. My name is Abhishek. And before I begin, a very happy new year. Uh, wishing all of you a, a successful year filled with happiness, love, and health. So let's quickly jump into understanding a little bit on digital transformation for real estate uh, with a clear focus on the why, what, and the how. So a quick intro about the firm. Uh, HMPL Consulting is a design consulting firm. We have been in business for over 10 years now. Uh, predominantly partnering with our clients for digital transformation strategy and also the implementation through change management and upskilling of workforce uh, to be able to uh, be part of the digital reality. And about me, my name is Abhishek, as you know, and I am from Bengaluru. I've completed my specialization in digital transformation from the University of Virginia. I started my practical experience in digital transformation in the year 2012, where I partnered with Vistion, one of the largest uh, automotive manufacturing companies globally, uh, where I worked with uh, at one of their factories in Chennai in India uh, with the intent of warehouse digitization. And in the year 2016, I moved to real estate uh, where I was working with smart homes and working with the insurance sector for smart homes. And uh, my entry into uh, commercial real estate happened in the year 2017. Uh, and in the from then on, I've worked with uh, clients globally in India, London, uh, Singapore, and Japan, and some marquee clients and some great experience across uh, different uh, domains, commercial real estate, uh, workspaces, and uh, retail spaces as well. And along with this, I had the golden opportunity of volunteering at one of the largest uh, uh, medical health uh, healthcare initiative in India uh, with a uh, not-for-profit called Step One, uh, which today manages about half a million of more than five million uh, patients pan India. Uh, India and healthcare is two things. That it's, a, it's a huge challenge for the Indian government. A, because of the size of the population and also resource constraints. So step one, uh, with the idea of bringing in technology to make healthcare affordable to every individual across India, joins hands with state government authorities in digital transformation of healthcare. So I partner with the state governments in the same initiative uh, where I work with the uh, CEOs of states to understand their digital uh, healthcare initiative, bringing the right tools, uh, upskilling their uh, health healthcare workforce to be able to offer uh, healthcare to every individual under their uh, you know state residency. So that's a quick introduction about me. So what is digital transformation? So uh, digital transformation is a constant exchange of data. Uh, between the various stakeholders within the ecosystem and the ecosystem here could be within the organization or part of the ecosystem and uh, why do we do this uh, constant data exchange is to drive customer experience uh, improve our operations and the processes and of course to adopt or adapt ourselves to the changing business models let's look a little deeper into the same uh, before that a quick example is about best buy which is one of the retail giant space of us uh, so at the end of 2012, uh, uh, not only the market, but even the team at Best Buy almost thought they were dead and they could not compete with Amazon. Amazon is not a retail player. They were a technology player, but they started building uh, retail as a layer on top of their existing business and started competing with giants like Best Buy. That's when Hubert Jolly joined uh, Best Buy and he brought in a different perspective, which he calls the digital first perspective where he tried to change the way Best Buy uh, operated from being just another brick and mortar store to being one of the biggest leaders in uh, online uh, e-commerce as well. So uh, as Hubert Jolly mentions, their first focus was trying to understand their customer. Surprisingly, they built about 12,000 attributes for every customer to understand the journey of a customer. And uh, during this exercise, what they realized was uh, until now, Best Buy has been looking at customers of are only those who entered their retail store. But uh, Hubert Jolie mentions that new vision uh, meant that if uh, one of the stores in New York, then everybody staying in New York is a customer for Best Buy. And how is this possible? And with the data that they had already collected and the data analytics that was running at the background, they were able to generate insights to engage with customer much before they could actually make a decision to come to Best Buy. So they started engaging with uh, customers uh, during the early discovery stage. They started providing insights. They started personalizing experience for the customer, ensuring that a successful sale happens. And even after the sale is done, they started engaging with customer in the post-sale experience, collecting data, understanding their feedback, and trying to improve their own operations. By doing this, they not only improved their uh, 
lifetime value with the customer, but it was also clearly showing in their growth where the stocks rocketed from $18 in the year 2012 to about 99 USD currently trading at the New York Stock Exchange. So uh, this is how digital transformation uh, changed the, uh, uh, the growth uh, trajectory for Best Buy. It was only possible because they built a new layer of digital technology on top of their existing brick and mortar store. So that was a quick example. So uh, now let's get a little deeper to understand the why, how, and the what for digital transformation. <laughs> So before getting into that, let's look at the evolution of uh, the industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution was about moving us predominantly from an agrarian model to a factory-based model. Uh, so this had a lot of advantages with the advent of steam engines. Uh, the reliance on manpower to move things or do tasks was moving to more uh, steam engine-led uh, 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 you know, locomotion. So this also meant uh, previous locomotive businesses like horse-drawn carriages were completely thrown off business and they remained just mere fossils. In the second industrial revolution, it was the time of Mr. Ford uh, where mass production was the name of the game. So he built his vertical uh, stack, which was based on uh, in partnerships with stakeholders, bringing in raw materials and churning out products at um, reduced costs. So uh, the customers could start affording, could start affording a car. Right. And this was the age of mass production and uh, that also saw a lot of uh, existing car manufacturers go out of business uh, because of the kind of impact of Ford and his processes had on the industry. The third industrial revolution was the age of internet and IT, where tasks were getting digitized, processes were happen, op optimized, and what we call as the first level of digitization started happening in the industry. And interestingly, in the fourth industrial revolution, we've started seeing uh, technology disrupting multiple industries. We've started to see new players who are not from the natural uh, playground have started disrupting the uh, existing uh, markets and industries for well-established players. Some of the examples are Airbnb, WeWork, and Uber. And how is this possible? It's a new business model that they've come out and they've started to execute. And let's look at a little detail of what the new business models of the new era is. So traditionally, like we see in the, in the case of the uh, second industrial revolution with what Mr. Ford has done, we've still continued the same, which is called as the vertical value chain. In a vertical value chain, companies take pride in building uh, a non-penetrable uh, fort around themselves, which is built on scale, which is built on uh, existing partnerships with suppliers that is basically picking up raw materials, processing them in the factory and then throwing out an output and building all of this at scale, which requires a lot of capital, which is a capital intensive, uh, intensive uh, uh, business. And this alone was uh, enough to create barriers for new entrants to enter the market. But we've seen uh, how Airbnb and WeWork and uh, Uber have changed this whole model where with uh, no uh, experience in the industry, uh, no well-established partnerships with the industry or no any uh, uh, extensive capital to build themselves in the earlier days have been able to disrupt the whole market, uh, which was previously unseen. So what's the model that these uh, new age businesses have been following is what is called as the horizontal stack, where they start digitizing every layer in the organization so that they're interconnected with each other within the organization and are also open to partnering with the ecosystem. Let's take the example of Uber. Uber digitized its entire ride-sharing platform and started allowing partners, which is the cab owners, and uh, to start integrating and the users to start integrating into this platform. They started becoming an exchange information exchange platform. And that's been the reason for success of Uber uh, globally. And they've been a scalable model as well. So that's the new age business model, which is about being horizontal, which is about being stacked and being able to be integrated with uh, not only internally, but also with an existing ecosystem as well. So let's look at uh, how this has impacted. Let's take an example of the fintech uh, industry. Uh, we've all seen how banking has been a horrendous experience in the past for us. Opening up a bank account was a pain. Um, it, had, it was lengthy, it had a lot of processes, and it almost was like, uh, we, it, was, it was just standardized and there was no customization happening there. It would be the same for anybody to go into a bank and the same experience for everybody. Because banks, took pride in creating the reputation for themselves. So people wanted to you know, keep their uh, uh, valuables at this particular bank, uh, 
bank A or a bank B. So that's what how the banks were built and they were built on scale. So that itself was an imprintable fort for new players to come into the banking system. But the change with technology, the new age fintech players started to use technology to personalize user experience and they started building in efficiency and accessibility and started building what is called the non-banking financial uh, systems. So with this, the uh, existing banks were started to feel threatened. So they wanted to oust these existing, uh, the new players, and they started to try to offer the same out of their own. But it was not possible because their organizational structure was not built for innovation. They were built for scale, but not for in innovation. And so they went back to their boardrooms and they realized, okay, we are not able to play the innovation game because the new entrants are much more smarter that they're able to bring in technology in a much different way. And their organization was not digitally equipped for the same. So they started stacking their own uh, uh, organization and they realized their biggest asset in the market today is their scale, their capability to be able to scale and the existing base of customers and the partnerships that they already have in place for bank to bank transaction or international transactions as well. So that is when they started offering banking as a service to these new age fintech firms. So the new age fintech firms could focus on the innovation, which is about customer experience, new age digital products of insurance or loans, and can sit on top of the existing banking infrastructure. So there was an exchange of information which was happening between the innovative new age startups and the existing scaled version of the banking system. This uh, has seen, has added great value to the ecosystem. And we're seeing FinTech uh, growing at, uh, uh, at a huge rate. And this has not only helped the existing banks survive and not be threatened by the ecosystem, they started looking at them as partners versus competitors, but also growing the same ecosystem. One of the key examples for this is State Bank of India, which uh, after partnering with fintech systems across India, has been able to scale their customer base to 440 million, which is much more than the population of US, which is today at 331 million. So that is the scale, that is the value growth that uh, partnering with an ecosystem allowed the State Bank of India to achieve. And this was only possible because State Bank of India realized that they could digitize their scale and their banking as a service uh, platform and they start integrating with existing or new age uh, startups and innovative uh, fintech firms. And those are the quick examples of understanding how uh, a stack layer business model actually helps us not just survive, but also grow in this uh, disruptive uh, new age economy. So how is this relevant for the real estate? So in, uh, in our current value chain, real estate is broken. So today a landowner focuses on selling land to a master developer. So his ROI is defined, particularly keeping in focus the master developer. And then a new uh, ROI is written by the master developer when he sells it to a sub developer. The same way when it goes to the asset owner and the end consumer. So when this broken value chain, when there is new ROI defined at every step of the value chain, there is value loss or value gap which happens. And that is where we have a loss of ROI. And uh, so we actually can see in digital transformation that when uh, each of the uh, player in the value chain, when they start looking at an end-to-end -end thinking, they not only add value to the end consumer, but also improve the return on investment for their own uh, growth as well. So uh, let's look at, so how does a real estate firm look at a digital transformation? So before we go into the framework, I want to share this three um, uh, basic laws for technology, which is the Moore's law, which says that computing power double, doubles every 18 months. The power to compute changes every 18 months. Butler's law, communication speed develops doubles every nine months. We're already talking about 6G and 5G is just getting implemented in few regions across the globe. Crider's law, storage capacity doubles every 13 months. These are the three basic laws on which the entire technology of digital revolution has been built on. So I wanted to share this with you because we will see a relevance to this in the next slide. So what is, how do we implement a successful digital transformation strategy in the organization? Is it about turning on the technology investment button? Do we go gung about in, you know, getting the new AI enabled applications? Or since we've been talking about data and information exchange, do I go into a paperless initiative? Let me collect all the possible data at every step of my organization. No, when not done right, digital transformation turns into an expensive facade. So this is not the right way of looking at digital transformation. So what is the right way? So this is the tried and tested uh, framework, which is being used by multiple businesses. 
and uh, kind of becoming the norm for digital transformation where digital transformation is not led by uh, any other problem statement but by just one trans one problem statement which is being uh, uh, adaptable to the new digital economy which means your top of this uh, uh, cone is your strategy which is divided you know driven by digital that stays at the top of the pyramid for you so your strategy is to be digital can you digitize your digitalize your entire business operations can you get into a stacked layer of approach like we've seen in the example of fintech or we've seen with the example of uber or an airbnb so it's having that strategy of being digital so when we start looking at having a digital uh, presence that's when digital transformation starts happening as a trickle down effect so it's very essential that at the leadership level we start looking at digital transformation itself as a new norm and not just solving one simple problem with a digital application the next step comes the digitizing the core so what is the core for any business it is people and it's uh, that's the first major chunk of any business so uh, it is since digital transformation is about the new age business model it also means that we bring a culture change within our organization we start changing the way our people start looking at uh, business our, our people start looking at processes how our people start looking at customers so this means we bring in change management within our people and organization so that they are inclined with the new digital strategy uh, which is at the helm of our organization the second most important thing is data and analytics as we've been seeing the new age business model is all about an exchange of information so data and analytics becomes very important so what does this mean for a real estate firm so we've been seeing a lot of uh, workspace quick example of a workspace we've been seeing a lot of workspace applications uh, running across the internet and a lot of case studies coming out so can you have an approach which says okay i'm going to digitize this particular problem for this uh, quarter and then look at some other problem the next quarter no when we talk about data analytics it is about having a common data environment a common data pool for an entire organization why this becomes very essential is a it produces great analytics and b it produces uh, intelligent analytics which is correlation so we've already seen this example it's not something new where uh, occupancy data was previously seen to understand real estate utilization but when the same data shared with the lighting with the hvac and the maintenance we've started seeing the value of this uh, single data point called as occupancy of the real estate so that's how exchangeable and intelligent exchange of information happens between multiple processes when they are pooled into a common data environment so having a common data environment strategy is very essential for you in your digital transformation journey and then comes your analytics analytics is not standard dashboards which is bought off the shelf and which your dashboards cannot be defined by your product partners it has to be defined by you you define your dashboards based on your own kpis so every team have their own kpis so they have their own dashboards which is customized for their kpis because these dashboards are what which will define the way they work because they will be relying a lot on these inputs for their operations and the third thing of course is technology so in technology we uh, have to be clearly focused on having an open uh, protocol which is inter exchangeable where you cannot have silo and legacy systems this also means that we will have to move away from our current thinking of having in house hosted uh, data servers to moving to the cloud a moving to the cloud allows us to have greater computing power greater storage space and also bring in uh, harness the value of data because then you're able to create a common data environment across the organization are able to run intelligent analytics and also when your organization is stacked for a digital economy you're also able to share this information exchange for value with the players in the ecosystem right so this, this is how we look at digitizing the core of our business and the fourth important point is the ecosystem uh, as we've been seeing the new age digital model is all about ecosystem we cannot define us as an uh, and as an individual entity and see how we could grow that we will not be able to sustain in this new age uh, digital world with this uh, mindset so this demands that we start partnering with other players in the ecosystem who bring in that other layer of innovation on top of it and we start seeing how we could exchange information with them for value so this is a quick introduction to the framework which is essential for digital transformation in real estate so what is the outcome of me following this particular digital transformation framework is now what was a broken value chain starts becoming one end to end thinking value chain 
So let's, let me give you a quick example of what happened with WeWork. WeWork started as an end consumer. They started buying assets from asset owners and then subleasing or subletting it to uh, other uh, players. By uh, managing the operations, they started charging higher per square feet uh, rates. And when they did this for a while, they started collecting data. They realized what customers want. They were now in a better decision to make decisions as an asset owner. They now were able to identify a valuable asset and able to relate it to the investment, the return on investment because they understood the end consumers. So they turned into an asset owner. And when they were an asset owner, they also started uh, you know, dictate or uh, uh, you know, requesting um, uh, building assets in a particular way from the sub developer as well. So this way they were able to improve their ROI across the value chain by being having an end to end thinking. So the same thing happens with us in the value chain as well. When we start having this exchange of information for value, we start improving our ROI. So a landowner can now start looking at not just selling a land to a master developer, but talking about uh, other data points that can be collected across us and which can be passed on to the master developer. The master developer who designs and uh, the plots can also start sharing device, you know, uh, sharing data around how he's connected with the utility companies and how have they been part of the decision making process and what are the uh, uh, sustainability norms that we talk about, what are the uh, regulations and the compliance that were agreed upon. So once this data is shared with the sub developer, sub developer then starts building assets uh, based on this data and then can share the same again with the asset owners. So here is a change which happens because asset owners have the buying power. So when they start making decisions based on data, they start valuing that and they start uh, paying you higher for your per square feet uh, value. This in turn means the sub developer and master developer and landowner are all uh, benefited from this uh, exchange of information which has happened because the asset owner, asset owner is now paying higher per square feet for this valuable information because this means he then can allow can build on top of this layer and then have the same information along with new information which is passed on to the end consumers for the maintenance of the facilities and uh, for also improving the occupant experience as well. So that was a quick uh, uh, understanding of how digital transformation is uh, can change the real estate uh, space. So uh, now what are the key drivers for our digital transformation? So as you see, it is culture and it is privacy. So digital transformation is very much technology. So that means we should have a clear IT uh, strategy in place, which is talking about security, data privacy, and end user privacy as well. So it is very essential that you don't look at it uh, or outsource all of these op uh, operations, but try to build these in-house, bringing in consulting firms to work with you and bringing in new culture, change management, and also working with you in your technology and privacy and data privacy uh, aspects. So once these two are created, you start looking at what is called the digital product management. You've, you've had a particular, you already have a particular way of doing, you have your own strategy of designing uh, or looking at real estate. It will be essential for you to start building a digital layer on top of it, which is a digital product management. And once you start building this digital product management, you start creating digital twins, which is again, like we spoke about having common data environment, creating uh, data analytics platforms, which is common data environment, picking up sensor data, picking up uh, user experience data, operations data, all of these coming under one uh, umbrella of a common data environment. And the most important part is the intelligence where we start running analytics to help us in our daily uh, uh, operations. So that's how we start driving uh, value from a digital transformation initiative. So that yes, there was these uh, were some quick insights that I wanted to share with you. Of course, I wanted to get deeper, uh, but uh, we just have 30 minutes. But having said that, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or write to me at my email and we can always speak further on the same. Thank you so much for your valuable time and you guys have a great day ahead. Thank you.